this this is comical to me to some degree, and this is where Dion's inconsistent logic always troubles me. The guy left Jackson, Mississippi for one of the whitest places on the planet. <laughs> where do you predict Shador and Travis going in the draft? Top four. Mm. That's pretty beautiful. Anywhere from one through four. One of them is going to be one. Mm. That's what I'm talking about. One of them is going to be speaking into existence. And the, the, the latter one would not go behind four. Mm. Now, all this is subjective because I know where I want, kind of want them to go. Mm-hmm. And let's not forget shallow, okay? Mm-hmm. But I know where I want them to go. So in certain cities that ain't, ain't going to happen. It's okay, you want point? It's going to be, a, it's not a, I'm sorry, it's going to be an Eli. Mm. Yeah, we ain't, we ain't doing Hmm. Uh, you're, I think Dion's out over skis. I, I think that Shadur, to me, calling this guy a top four pick at this point, I get a dad saying it, but thinking he's got the leverage to dictate where he's going to play, I think that's preposterous. Jason, it kind of reminds me of Dion's uh, draft day, 1989, that loaded draft where four of the first five players, I believe, were Hall of Famers. And the number three pick, uh, I think, was at Detroit. Atlanta was four. So <laughs> Detroit ends up taking some running back out of Oklahoma State and ended up being pretty good. So he wanted to go to Atlanta. It was the South. It was Chocolate City. He fit perfectly there, right? So <laughs> Atlanta picks him number four. And I believe it was Andrea Kramer who was at his home. And he has his Mr. T starter set, the Jerry Curls glistening real nice. And and Miss Kramer said, well, Dion, I know that Detroit was interested. I mean, what if Detroit would have taken you? And Dion said, no, 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 no. I would have asked for so much, they would have had to put me on layaway. One of the great moments in draft history. But here's the thing, though, Jason. Everyone talks about the Eli Manning situation. And obviously, everyone talks about John Elway. His father did not want him to play for Frank Cush under the ownership of Robert Ursay. So th- there's a precedent. It's okay. It is what it is. My question is this. Let's say either one of those players gets drafted into a city or franchise that is not amenable to that group. That is fine. That is their, that is their prerogative. My question is, do they have the guts and the character to be a Bo Jackson? Jason, keep this in mind. In the 1986 draft, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers had the number one pick. And if you remember what happened, Hugh Culverhouse, the owner of the Buccaneers, he planned some trip for Bo Jackson. He said, no, no, don't worry about it. It's not going to affect your eligibility with baseball. And Bo Jackson said, okay, you're the number one pick. I'm going to go visit you. And it was incorrect information. The NCAA basically said you're your career is over. And Bo loved baseball. Nobody understood how much he loved baseball. But once his Auburn eligibility was curtailed, he told everybody, including the Buccaneers, don't draft me. I'm not going to play. Don't even think about it. And and no one took him seriously, Jason. Guess what? By 86, 87, he was playing left field for the Kansas City Royals. And then on a lark in the fifth, sixth round of the 87 draft, Al Davis said, you know what? Let's pick that left fielder. Five months later, he has a new hobby. So, again, this can be done, but I'm just saying, do you have the character and do you have the wherewithal to be a Vincent Bo Jackson? So, Dion, in that interview, said a couple other things. He he indicated, he mentioned San Francisco, Dallas, Washington, and Baltimore as potential landing spots for these guys. And then he added this quote. Uh, there were certain cities, he's talking about himself, there were certain cities that fit for me. Atlanta fit, and I want that for my kids, all of them. I want the right fit. Atlanta was the first time I saw black people in positions of authority. It blew my mind. It was real in Atlanta. I had never seen anything like that in my life. And so I I guess that's why he's including Washington and Baltimore on this list, D.C. and Baltimore, about as chocolate a cities as you can get. 
San Francisco is about as liberal as you can get. Dallas, obviously, is, you know, his kids grew up in Texas, and he's got a connection to the Dallas Cowboys. But, but to, to, to this whole Atlanta and black people of seeing in charge or whatever, this, this is comical to me to some degree. And this is where Dion's inconsistent logic always troubles me. The guy left Jackson, Mississippi for one of the whitest places on the planet, <laughs> Boulder, Colorado. And now he's talking about fit. And, you know, my, you know, I haven't seen, I only saw black people in authority in Atlanta. Dion just talks and talks and talks and people go for it. He knows he can say anything and no, no one holds him accountable or no one expects his logic to make sense. But it's just Dion. He's great. And he's got the attitude. But. The man left Jackson, Mississippi yeah. at an HBCU to go coach at one of the whitest universities in America, but uh, he wants his sons to see uh, black people in authority. And, he's, and, and you know, do, I, I'm just sorry. This is just me keeping it real. If you go look at the homicide rates for young black men, Uh-oh. Baltimore and Washington, D.C., mm. Oh boy, uh, is is that really where I want my son, my young sons to be? Go look at the homicide rates. Is that is that where I want? You, you want to talk about? They got some chain snatchers in D.C. and Baltimore, and Dion and his kids love to wear chains. But that's just me. Jason, let, let's look at this from a pure football standpoint because I didn't hear the teams that he really or the cities that he preferred his son to be in. I'm assuming that Coach Prime thinks his son's going to be a starting caliber quarterback that's going to play right. Okay, Baltimore. Huh. They have an MVP coming back that seems to have the second half of his career still going, right, Jason? I, I don't know. I think Lamar's pretty entrenched. Washington looks like they are going to draft a franchise or a top-level quarterback, they think, in this draft, right? They got rid of Sam Howell. San Francisco, I believe, has hitched their wagon to Brock Purdy no matter what we think. So right then off the bat, here's another issue, Jason, just from a practical standpoint. I've had NFL or former NFL players tell me that the most important thing that we have, if we're going to have a real career, and what I mean by real career is you get to your second contract, you got to get that service time going. So you got to step onto a playing field and get that first step towards free agency in four to five years. So are you really going to step out and just sit out a whole year to make a point because you don't like what city you're in? And withhold your – and I get it. They've made a lot of NIL money. Maybe that's not a factor. But there, there are certain things to think about here. And I I find it interesting. I think Travis Hunter is a top-10 pick, no doubt about it. He can play both ways. He's versatile, legitimate playmaker. As it relates to Shador, and you may want to get Coach JB on, Jason, if you look at the track record of the 2021 and 2022 quarterback class, which has just been one bust after another for the most part. I believe that NFL teams are going to start looking like, mm, who are we drafting here? Are these quarterbacks really all worth first-round grades? I wonder if that's going to impact future quarterback classes. With that being said, this quarterback class will still have guys drafted really high, probably two or three in the top ten. And as I look at these guys like a Drake May, Jaden Daniels, who I like, and obviously Caleb Williams, ask yourself this, Jason, as flawed as those guys may be, would you put Shadour in that category of talent and production? I wouldn't. I'm not big on Caleb Williams. And so agreed. Agreed. Uh, and, and so do I think Shadour may be Caleb? Williams? I don't know what to make of Shadour, to be quite honest with you. The, the offense was so tilted for him to perform well and then he took so many shots i've seen quarterbacks ruined in college from taking too many hits yeah. and they're never the same and then so i think some of the athleticism that shadur has that works at the college level is not going to work at all in the nfl he, he's a four eight five forty guy he's not he didn't get Dion speed so I don't think he's going to be much of a runner in the NFL. He, he, he's going to have to be a pocket passer. And, and I just think he's been under Dion's bubble for too long, in my opinion. And, and so 
what, what's he going to do in the NFL and what's an NFL team going to do when they draft a quarterback in the first round, maybe, that who, who calls his dad and his dad is the smartest guy in the room in every situation, even though he may be really at the bottom of the room, but he thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. I, I, I just think Shadur could be ruined by his father and, and, you know, he needed to be pushed out of the nest after his high school career. He hasn't been out of the nest. I don't know what to make of Shadur. I've seen many throws where I was like, wow, that's the real yeah. deal. But I just worry about all the, the number of hits, playing for his dad, his relationship with the Sean Davis is now the head coach at San Diego State. Are we just going to see a repeat of that? I, I, I don't know what to make of Shadur. I, I'm not convinced he's going to be a great NFL player. Yeah, and by the way, um, I, I wonder if Skip Bayless still has him as the number one pick in the draft. By the way, I just want to mention this. I said this to you yesterday. I love Michael Irvin. You know, that's one of my favorite athletes. You, you know he's on my Mount Rushmore of Miami Hurricanes. They did a segment last week, him and Skip, talking about the NBA prospects of Bronny James. He scored 4.8 points a game on a bad USC team. And they did a whole segment. Like, Do you think Bronny's ready for the NBA? No, I would say no, he's probably not. Okay, I, It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. If you enjoyed that video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe so you never miss a moment of fearless. We'll